My name is Nilesh. Welcome to part 2 of auto scaling containers with Keda on AKS or Azure Kubernetes service. In part 1, we had a quick overview of the application that we are using as part of this series. We set up the infrastructure for development and we also provisioned Azure Kubernetes service cluster. In this part 2, we are going to install RabbitMQ on the AKS cluster. We will package the .NET Core application into Docker containers and publish these containers to Docker Hub public container registry. Then we will deploy this onto the AKS cluster as the application. And in part three, we will look at Keda architecture, install Keda on the AKS cluster and auto scale containers using Keda. So let's get started with the overview of the application. So like I described in the last uh, demo or last video, we are going to use Azure Kubernetes service AKS cluster to deploy a containerized version of RabbitMQ and a producer, which is again a .NET Core application, a web API, which will populate or produce a configured number of messages, let's say thousand. And then there would be a consumer which will consume these messages in a batch. So the size of the batch again is configurable. And the source code for all this is available in my GitHub repo at the PD TechFest 2019. So let's start by looking at the application and try to understand the structure of the code and how the producers and consumers work. So we'll be using RabbitMQ as the messaging layer and we will use a .NET Core API to produce a configurable number of messages. And we will use a .NET Core EXE to consume a configured number of messages in a batch. And the consumer simulates a long running process with an artificial delay in order to show that we can auto scale uh, when the need arises in the third part of the series. So let's look at the AKS cluster, which we provisioned in the uh, last demo. So let me fire up Fluent Terminal and query the cluster, AKS cluster. So I can start with kubectl, get nodes to see what are the nodes available. And it's a problem we don't have the cluster running. So looks like my auto scheduler, there is uh, actually a script which is running Azure function, which checks if there is any subscription or any resource I have with the prefix as demo, and it goes and deletes them on daily basis. So this is used to reduce the cost and somehow this has kicked in and the cluster which I created earlier has been uh, deleted. So let me recreate the cluster and then we will walk through the uh, source code. So to create the cluster again, I will use the same uh, initialize AKS script, which I used last time. So the script is available in this project under the PowerShell folder. So if I list down the scripts, we can see it's the initialize AKS. So last time I used initialize AKS uh, without any parameters using all the default values. So this time, let me show you how we can override the values. So in that script, we had parameters for uh, different things like, let's go back to PowerShell and look at the initialize AKS here. Let me just zoom in a little bit. And the number of parameters it takes is the subscription name, resource group name, and uh, this is defaulted to demo Keda series RG. So let me override this with a different name. And the name of the parameter is resource group name. So I can say here resource group name, and give a different name. So let me say part two, Keda demo. And 
rest of the uh, parameters will be the same. So here I'm overriding the default parameter and it will create the cluster and uh, it will take some time to provision this cluster. So while the cluster is getting provisioned, let me show you the different components of this particular project. So all the .NET core is available under SRC and this is structured under uh, three modules. There is TechTalks model, uh, TechTalks MQ consumer and TechTalks MQ producer and there are PowerShell scripts, there are uh, YAML files, which are Kubernetes manifest files, and uh, there is uh, things related to Helm and some images. So we will be focusing mainly on uh, SRC, PowerShell, and KHS scripts in this discussion. So uh, let's look at the first one, which is the producer. And let me just close this script. So the producer is a .NET API or .NET Core API and uh, it has a controller, TechTalks API controller. So this TechTalks is, a, you can think of it like an application to manage uh, TechTalks and it's like a to-do list which allows you to create TechTalks, delete TechTalks and I'm trying to create a small subset of that functionality here. So in this controller, uh, it takes a message queue, a tech talks event publisher as an dependency. So this is an abstraction over a messaging infrastructure. So currently we are using RabbitMQ, but in future this can be replaced and the implementation of the tech talks event publisher can be hidden behind this message queue. So uh, via dependency injection, I'm injecting the event publisher and there is a method called generate. So this generate method takes the number of messages as an input to generate a series of tech talks. As part of the tech talks, it looks at a sort of a model and uh, it creates a list. So uh, let's say categories. Categories can be of type meetup, a free conference, a paid conference, hackathon, or uh, some event organized by event tribe. Then the description is like one-to-one -one mapping between meetup it's a community event organized via meetup for a tech conference. It's a free tech conference and so on and so forth. For the levels, we have different levels starting with beginner as 100, 200 for intermediate, 300 for advanced and 400 for the expert. Then I use a library called Faker. So Faker comes from, let me show the dependencies of this project to you. So there is a package called Bogus, which allows you to generate a uh, different uh, sort of uh, domain objects, or this can be used for creating fake objects. So since I'm trying to create a number of messages here, I don't want to handcraft each and every message. So what this allows me to do the faker is to define set of rules for creating or assigning values to each of the fields within that particular uh, class. So I'm trying to create a collection of tech talks here and I set a rule that the ID should have a random number between one to thousand for the tech talk name. Uh, it should be one of the word from Lorem Ipsum for the category ID. Uh, since we have five categories, I'm randomly picking a number between one to five. And then there is a category which needs to be assigned to the uh, field category, which again uses the uh, nested naming or nested objects and uh, the same process follows. So for the ID, we, we pick ID between one to five randomly for the category name and the names are uh, randomly chosen from one of these five category names listed above or created above. And uh, once this object structure is set, I can call the generate method and pass it the number of messages. So this will generate as many number of messages as I want. And then finally, I call the send message on the messaging infrastructure message queue. So let's look at the definition of this message queue. This is residing in the messaging folder and it has an interface, which is iTechTalks events publisher. There's only one method right now on this send messages and it takes the list of tech talks as the input. So let's look at the implementation of this. 
So uh, this Tech Talks events publisher is the one which is actually interacting with the RabbitMQ. So we have a queue name and the routing key, which is currently hard coded to hello here. And there are dynamic parameters or uh, values which are taken uh, specifically for the RabbitMQ related part, which is the host name, username and password. These are taken from the configuration. So if we follow the uh, principles of uh, cloud native applications, we should not hard code environment specific values and this should come from a centralized location or as a configuration file. So I'm using a similar approach where these values would be specified in the environment configuration and I assign them to these variables as part of the constructor initialization. And when the send message is called, it creates a connection factory uh, with these uh, parameters related to the RabbitMQ hostname, username and password. It uses these credentials and creates a connection. The connection, uh, it connects to a particular instance of a queue. So on the RabbitMQ cluster, there could be multiple queues. And here we are connecting to a queue named hello. And we specify the properties which are required for the queue. Like is it a durable one? Should we auto delete the message and some additional arguments? And we also serialize the talks here. So we get a talk object and then we serialize that using a JSON converter into a UTF-8 encoded message. And we put all this by using the publish message onto the RabbitMQ. So that's the controller part. Uh, for the controller, uh, the way these services get injected. So if you look at the dependency injection part, so uh, the Tech Talks controller is dependent on uh, Tech Talks event publisher. Uh, for injecting the dependencies, I'm using the .NET Core methods or the uh, infrastructure of .NET Core itself. So there is a startup method uh, which has information about the configuration. So this is all available as part of the uh, .NET Core API project type and I'm using the configuration here uh, to add this into the services. So I configure all these services as part of the service collection and in the services I say anytime there is a reference to I configuration inject the implementation of this provider as the configuration. So whoever is using I configuration as a dependency uh, the infrastructure or the middle tier or middleware of ASP.NET Core will take sure or make sure uh, that uh, this is injected properly into the classes which is calling these dependencies. Same way for the event publisher, when the interface is I Tech Talks event publisher, it will get a concrete instance of Tech Talks event publisher. So that's on the producer side. On the consumer side, uh, so before we go to the consumer, let me show you the model or the object which is used by this Tech Talks. So in this, I'm using this Tech Talks definition or it's like a uh, data model which is used to transfer the messages. So it has an ID, Tech Talk name, category, category ID and category. So initially when I built this application, this was built on the entity framework and it was uh, writing messages onto a SQL server in container. That's why uh, some of these concepts like the level ID and the level, they are coming from that original code, but I've kept it intact for this example as well. So once we have this model, the consumer consumes this. So the structure on the consumer side is uh, similar, uh, but since it's a .NET EXE, the type of this consumer is an executable. It's not an API. So we have program, program.cs, uh, which is uh, starting the uh, process or consumes the messages. So here uh, we create again the configure the services and as part of service configuration, we take values from the environment. So let me just zoom in a little bit here. And highlight the code which is doing the configuration part. So this particular method configure environment is the one 
uh, which is building the configuration using configuration builder. Uh, in case of the .NET Core API project, this is handled by the uh, MVC infrastructure or the way the services are all built up. But for an EXE, we have to do this additional step. So uh, as part of building this configuration, we look at the current base directory where it is uh, deployed and we set that as a ba base path. We add the JSON file with the app settings environment.json as one of the configuration elements and then we also specify that the environment variables should be part of the configuration builder. Once these are available, we call the configuration uh, builders build method and these configurations are then available for the classes who wants to use this. Uh, similar to the services on the producer side, uh, we have the services mentioned here. and uh, these are coming from uh, the singleton. So we add uh, same way the configuration and the tech talks events consumer. So let's look at the tech talks event consumer. So the interface for this has one method, which is consume message. And if you look at the implementation of this, tech talks event consumer. It looks similar to the producer. So we have the queue name and the routing key and the information related to EBITMQ, the host name, username, password. Uh, the constructor of the, we are looking in the publisher again. I apologize for that. Let me just close this down and open it from the side panel. So on the consumer, when we go to the messaging, there is the event consumer implementation. So as I said, uh, the first part looks similar where the queue name routing key, these are currently hard coded in the code, uh, but we have the environment variables for host name, username and password and the additional environment variable, which is the batch size. So we are using this batch size to pick up a certain number of records uh, in a batch. So all these are uh, specified are set as part of the constructor and the consume message creates a connection factory using the credentials for the host name. It creates a connection uh, using that factory to the queue. So the queue named hello is referred here. And uh, here on the consumer side, we specify arguments like should the message be auto deleted. And in this case, we are setting it to false and uh, we set the prefetch count here uh, as the number of uh, messages as per the batch size. So this is where as part of the uh, fetching, those many number of messages will be fetched in one go. And when the message is received, we go through uh, this process where uh, it's a byte. If you remember, the producer created a byte stream and pushed it onto the RabbitMQ. So we look at the body of each message. We get the uh, message from there, which is uh, UTF-8 encoded, and we deserialize that using the JSON converter. And then to simulate the process of uh, heavy workload, we uh, put a sleep of two seconds, and then we just uh, log these details. So the details related to the ID, name, category, and the level that we received from the producer. and uh, after two seconds, we would acknowledge that message and uh, that's how the producer would know or RabbitMQ would know that this message has been consumed. So now let's go and look back if the cluster is uh, ready. <clears throat> 
looks like there is some problem with the cluster creation at this point of time mm. let's try to recreate it using the default parameters or let me just say part 2 Ada cluster and try recreating it. So let me rename this tile saying this will be used for all the PowerShell activities. And let me create one more window which we will use for running all our docker commands so this one is for docker so coming back to docker now uh, once we have this code which is producing and consuming uh, we need to create a custom image or a docker image of this which can be deployed onto the AKS cluster so for that I'm using uh, the docker file which is a multi-stage build so what does a multi-stage build means uh, in docker we can specify how we want to build the image as part of a file named docker file and this list a uh, series of instructions using which docker will create the uh, container image for this or a template for our application so let's look at the consumer for example we start with a base image which is ASP.NET Core build version and we name it as build environment. Then we create a work directory. We copy the tech talks consumer into uh, that particular working directory and tech talks consumer depends on tech talks model. So we also copy tech talks model. We copy the NuGet config file so that it has a reference to the NuGet packages. And then we run the .NET restore command. And uh, if the restore is successful, then we go and publish the application in the release configuration. And uh, this will create a DLL. So uh, this version of the image, the .NET Core build has all the build tools required for building a .NET Core, ASP.NET Core application. But when we deploy the application, we don't need all the build tools or we don't need all the debugging tools. We need only the runtime. And that's where we use the Microsoft ASP.NET Core uh, uh, runtime image. And this image is much more smaller in size. It is optimized for running in a production environment. In this, we copy from the earlier stage, which was our build environment, the release output. So we only need the release output from that build stage. We don't need all of the intermediate output. And once this is done, when the image is deployed onto the target environment, we can trigger uh, the uh, process which is required to run. So that is specified using entry point and we are running TechTalks MQ consumer DLL when the instance of this consumer is started. So the same way on the producer side, I have a Docker file uh, which is using the .NET 2.1 version of the SDK image and uh, it copies into a directory called TechTalks API. It follows a similar process where the TechTalks API project is copied in and uh, it runs the release and then it uses the runtime image to run TechTalks API. Actually this is using the old version and uh, the reason I'm showing you this is uh, there is the docker extension which has support for all this color coding and it has support for uh, similar to the uh, autocomplete but i'm using a different version of this which is not within the project folder but outside the reason for this is instead of building each of these projects or uh, each of these containers uh, individually i use docker compose which is uh, like a shortcut uh, and in this case I define the services which I want to use uh, say TechTalks producer what is the name of the image I want to tag this with so this will be tagged as uh, Nilesh Kule TechTalks producer and 
I want to give it a specific tag. So this is like a version of that image. In this case, I'm calling it RabbitMQ Kida. And this is coming from a file called a uh, Docker file, Tech Talks MQ producer. So this is the one which will actually be used. And in this case, you can see that uh, it's referring to the Tech Talks MQ consumer folder here. So uh, please ignore the Docker file from the previous uh, folder, which I showed. So in this case, I'm copying both the consumer uh, and the uh, Tech Talks model. So we were referring to the producer. So let me go back to the producer. Uh, producer is again same. We take from Tech Talks producer and the Tech Talks model uh, and we do the .NET restore. We publish in the release configuration and then we use the .NET 2.1 ASP .NET Core runtime version here. And uh, this is for the runtime image and we use uh, .NET and we run uh, .NET uh, Tech Talks MQ producer DLL as part of the entry point. So now we have the producer and the consumer uh, Docker files ready. To build them, I use the compose. So let's look at the Docker commands which we will use to build this file. First, let me see what are the images that I have. This can be done using Docker images. So here you can see there are multiple images which are there and there are some images which are with the tag as none. So these are the intermediate images which are created during the build process. So I can say uh, delete all these intermediate images by saying docker system prune. This will delete the images which are not currently in use and the ones which are intermediate releases. So I have around 400 MB of space reclaimed as part of this process. Now, if I run Docker images again, we will see a slightly different output. So we see that uh, there is a Tech Talks consumer, Tech Talks producer. Uh, these are both tagged as RabbitMQ Keda. There was a version of Tech Talks API earlier. So these were created around 14 hours ago. And if you look at the size, uh, the size of Tech Talks consumer image is around uh, 357 MB. Let me zoom in a bit. Okay. So uh, this is the size of uh, Tech Talks uh, consumer, is it? Yes. And the second one is the size of Tech Talks producer. So This is 257 MB. Uh, so if we look at the sizes of the Tech Talks consumer and the Tech Talks producer, which are based on ASP.NET Core versions of the image, uh, we look at the bottom here. Sorry. Let me just highlight the image size and let me show you the sizes of those images for some reason the mouse is not appearing so let's go control 4 zoom again escape okay docker images Let's start with a clear screen. Okay, Docker images. And let's look at the .NET version of the images. So let me zoom in again here. There is some problem with the zoom it application. Uh, 
try one more time. zoom and you see okay let me do it without zooming uh, you see here the first image let's look at what the consumer is using so tiktok's consumer for building it's using asp net core build image this so if i go here asp net core build image from Microsoft uh, it is 2.2 GB in size and the one which is used for the runtime version of the consumer is Microsoft ASP.NET Core not the build version so ASP.NET Core is 347 MB so you can see when the consumer is created the size of consumer is 357 MB that means the actual code which is for the consumer is about 10 MB on top of that base image of uh, 347 MB. Now let's look at the producer. So the producer is using 2.1 300 SDK version for the build. So 2.1 300 SDK is uh, this image which is 1.7 GB and if we look at the producer here uh, it's 257 MB which is from the 218 sorry 255 MB of the runtime image so microsoft.net runtime version here is 255 so we have the producer which is just about uh, 4 MB in size on top of the base image so now let's go and build our images so as I said I use uh, docker but docker compose and compose allows me to build these two images together so i'll be using this docker compose build file and i will build the producer and consumer in one go so i can specify the file here as docker compose build and I should be in the location where I want to run this command. So I'm currently at the top level. That's why it's not auto completing. So let me navigate to the project folder. And I have the Docker compose uh, build file in this location. So let's fire Docker compose. docker compose give the file name as docker compose build dot yaml and i want to build the images there is a spelling mistake so let me just correct that quickly Let's fire docker, docker compose, file, docker compose, build and the process I want to trigger is the build process. So this will go and start building that particular uh, services. So in the services I've specified producer and consumer. So whatever is defined in the Docker file for producer 
it will perform those steps. So you can see here that it's placing the image on the .NET Core version 2.1. It's creating the latest version of uh, the dependencies and it's building that version of the image. And similarly, it will go and create the Tech Talks consumer. So now it has started building the uh, producer. This is still working with the producer, but in a short while, we should see the consumer also building. In the meantime, let me check if the cluster has been created. So uh, yes, now the cluster has been provisioned. Let me go and just see if we have the two nodes available. So kubectl get nodes. Since the default size of the cluster is two nodes, we have two nodes here. And in the PowerShell scripts, I have a script called browse aks which will connect me to this uh, clusters uh, dashboard so you can run browse from this current folder which will merge the context and it will connect me to the dashboard of the cluster okay browse aks i need to give the name of the resource group so a resource group name and it is part two Keda cluster. So let me just change it here from initialize to browse. So let's look at the nodes here. We do have two nodes and if you look at one of them, okay. So the cluster is ready. Let's go to the overview and uh, there is nothing deployed on the cluster right now. So let's go back to the scripts and see if the images are built. So now we have the producer and the consumer images built. Let's verify that we have the latest version built uh, some time back. So if I run the docker images command again, I should see uh, this was built 10 hours ago. The tech talks consumer and producer Something is wrong with the timing. I'm not sure why it's showing 10 hours, but earlier, if you see, uh, the earlier versions of the images was 14 hours before. So let me just try running it once again, the build process. So Docker system prune. Yes, clear all images. Then go and run docker compose again docker compose file as docker compose build and the part as build or the command as build So while this is building, uh, let me go and deploy the uh, RabbitMQ onto the AKS cluster. So for deploying RabbitMQ, again, I have a PowerShell script and, and let's go into the PowerShell folder first, projects, PD tech fest and PowerShell. And let me list the contents. Uh, there is a script here called deploy rabbit mq so let me show that to you on the visual studio code so in powershell there is this deploy rabbit mq so uh, this rabbit mq deployment script uses helm uh, 
so as i said in the first uh, part of this series helm is the package manager for uh, kubernetes based applications uh, if you want to deploy rabbitmq uh, there are multiple components which needs to be deployed onto the cluster and uh, this gets packaged into what is called as a helm chart and we can use a command like helm install uh, we give the name of the release rabbitmq and whatever parameters we want to specify like i want to specify the rabbitmq username as user and password as password in this case and this is the uh, location or the package manager uh, the location of the package from where i want to install it so there is azure marketplace where a version of rabbitmq is available for deployment as a helm chart so i'm referring to that so this is like uh, maven central repository in case of helm i am referring to azure marketplace rabbitmq version of that so let me trigger this and uh, let's see uh, what components get deployed on the rabbitmq so first let's see what are the currently deployed uh, objects on the kubernetes cluster so kubernetes kubectl we get all and we will get it for all the namespaces so currently only the system objects are uh, deployed so the services for kubernetes core dns and everything which is uh, required to run the kubernetes cluster by default so now i will go and deploy the rabbitmq using that powershell script Let's run Helm repo update. So this is getting the latest version and uh, we can see that uh, it got update for the Azure marketplace. So after this, let's run the deployment again. And now RabbitMQ has been deployed onto the cluster. So you can see that it's almost instantaneous. And if I go back and run the same command, which was listing all the objects from all the namespaces, we should see additional pods for RabbitMQ. So the first one here, pod RabbitMQ, is the one which is related to RabbitMQ service. Then in terms of services itself, RabbitMQ uh, deploys two services in the default namespace one is named rabbitmq and the other one is named rabbitmq headless and uh, there is also at the bottom here you can see a default uh, stateful set apps rabbitmq is created in the namespaces so these objects they are all deployed as part of that helm chart deployment so now let's go back to the docker part where we were building the image and see if our images got updated. So docker images once again, still showing uh, 10 hours. Uh, looks like there is some problem with this. It's not identifying any updates or uh, there is no change in the code. That's why it's rebuilding. It's referring to the same image, but uh, we have this uh, tech talks consumer and uh, producer the latest versions of those images tagged with RabbitMQ KEDA as the tag. Let me try to push this to Docker Hub. So I will use the same command, which is Docker Compose. Uh, sorry. Let me see if the file is listed here. Yes, I have the Docker Compose built here. So Docker Compose and I give the file name docker compose build and instead of building i will be pushing the images now so if you don't have the docker compose file and the services defined in them you will have to push the image individually so uh, i would have to say like docker then name of the tag of the image uh, nilesh kule hyphen tech talks producer or consumer and then uh, get up uh, that tag and push so 
uh, this is again a helpful tip I find uh, uh, process where if we put everything in the compose file we can not only build them together but we can also push them together to the docker hub registry or whichever registry uh, container registry we are using so while this is getting pushed let me open docker hub and uh, see the version of these images so hub.docker.com So here we can see that the Tech Talks consumer and the Tech Talks producer have been updated a few seconds ago and the number of times these images have been downloaded. So now we have the cluster ready. We have the RabbitMQ deployed onto the cluster and we have uh, the images ready for deployment. Let's see how we can go ahead and deploy these onto the AKS cluster. So to deploy these images, I'm going to use what is called as the Kubernetes manifest file. So these manifest files are a declarative way of specifying how we want the deployment of a particular image to happen or a particular object to happen on the Kubernetes cluster. So let's start with the producer deployment. Uh, I want to specify the kind as deployment. So deployment is like a higher level API. Uh, which creates objects like pod in the background. Uh, we specify the metadata. In this case, uh, the metadata is RabbitMQ producer. Name is RabbitMQ producer deployment. I can specify the label. In terms of the specification, I want to specify two replicas of this uh, producer to be run when the deployment happens. And the template for deployment it's going to use is it's going to use the image Nitesh Kule Tech Talks producer with the tag RabbitMQ Keda and then I provide the environment variables here. So I specify the host name as RabbitMQ, I specify the username as user and password as password. Currently these are specified as clear text values and in one of the future videos I will show how this can be converted into a secret and we use the secret. So this will be exposed on the container port 8080 and uh, TCP will be the protocol used for that. In terms of image pull policy, we specify that this image needs to be pulled always onto the cluster. And uh, again, in terms of restart policy, we specify that the restart should happen always if the uh, policy is applied or if the image is uh, downloaded again. In terms of termination grace period, we specify it as 30 seconds. And uh, similar to this, we also have a service expose. So uh, since this is a web API and there are two replicas, we need a way to interact with those uh, API in a consistent manner. And that's where a uh, producer service, which load balances these two replicas comes into the picture. So I'm using uh, object of kind service from the Kubernetes API version v1. Uh, for the metadata, we specify name as the producer service. The type is load balancer, which means on the AKS cluster, it will provision a public IP and assign it to the load balancer. Uh, this is running on port 8080 and the selector for this service is RabbitMQ producer with the label as run. So if we look at the producer deployment, that would be a label run as RabbitMQ producer and that is what it will refer to. So we have the service and the deployment for the producer and for consumer, we only use the deployment. We don't have a service to uh, access the consumer publicly from outside. For producer, we will need this because dynamically we will change, we will be changing the number of messages that are populated. So in case of the consumer, the process is similar. We start with the type of deployment. We specify the metadata with the name and the label. In terms of replicas, we specify in the specification as one replica and the template that it's going to use is uh, for the container, it will use TechTalks consumer. And similar to the producer, 
it has a set of environment variables RabbitMQ hostname, username, password and if you remember there was an additional parameter for the RabbitMQ batch size so currently this is specified to 20 so how do we deploy this? these are the uh, specifications or this is like the definition of how the object should be deployed for deployment we use uh, the kubectl command so let me use this as the tab for kubectl so all the kubectl commands we will run from here let's clear this now from the powershell let's navigate back onto where all those scripts are stored in the kts folder so you can see the scripts here uh, these are organized in tech talks consumer tech talks producer so let's say i want to deploy the producer so i can say tech talks producer there are two files one for producer deployment and the other one is for service let's start with the producer deployment so i can use kubectl create create command and specify the file name as producer deployment.yml and we see that the object has been created deployment apps RabbitMQ producer deployment created so let's go and uh, query this object kubectl get pods and we can see that along with the rabbitmq pod there are now two pods related to rabbitmq producer deployment and both are in the state of container creating this is coming because if we go back and look at the producer definition for the deployment we specified replicas as two so now i want to deploy uh, the service as well the uh, problem is I can't or I don't want to go and type the name of the file every time which needs to be deployed uh, so for that purpose the kubectl command has a different version of create uh, which is taking the recursive one so I can say uh, take the file name hyphen f as the list of files and run it recursively so in this case uh, it created the service but it failed for the creation of deployment because the deployment already exists and this is the beauty of the kubernetes api it will look at the desired state configuration and it will create only the objects which are required or which have been modified between the existing state on the cluster and what we specify in these manifest files so the other approach to create this is instead of create we can use the apply command so i can apply an individual file as well as multiple files so if i say kubectl apply and i give the recursive flag again then it will try to apply the same uh, definitions but uh, if we look at the deployment here it says it's configured and at the service also it says the service is configured so there is no change in the definition these two objects have already been created on the AKS cluster that's why this kubectl apply command did not make any modifications to those definitions of the object so now we have the producer and uh, let's see how we can access this but before we start accessing the producer I want to show you how we can see at the RabbitMQ uh, side of the things. So RabbitMQ when it is deployed it gives a management UI. So let me just go to the same projects PD Tech Fest and PowerShell and let me rename this saying RabbitMQ UI. So I want to use this to uh, access the RabbitMQ UI service and in order to do that Kubernetes allows something called as port forwarding. So there is one command which we need to run 
and that's here. So let me show you the ports which are exposed by the service of uh, RabbitMQ. So if we go back to the overview and if we look at the services here on the Kubernetes plane, we should now see our RabbitMQ producer has been deployed. Uh, sorry, not the, uh, yeah, RabbitMQ producer as well as the uh, pods for RabbitMQ. And uh, when we look at the RabbitMQ service, uh, these are exposed on these different ports, 4369, 5672. Uh, and uh, same way, the headless service is also exposed on uh, the ports with the name as RabbitMQ hyphen headless. So to access this now, I can run a command which says, uh, from my uh, local laptop, uh, port forward to this particular RabbitMQ service. And that's the command I'm going to run now, which is the port forward name of the service and which port. So that port number 15672 I got from here. Okay. So let's run this command. And now uh, there is a port forwarding happening from my local host to this port. So if I go in the browser and I do localhost and hit the 15672 port, I should be redirected to the RabbitMQ UI. Localhost. And I specify the username and the password to log in. And this gives us a lot of information about the RabbitMQ. So if we look at the queues here, right now there are no queues and there is an admin interface. It shows us what are the different types of exchanges available, what are the different channels, what are the connections that this queue has. So since there is nothing, uh, let's go and start interacting using our application with this particular RabbitMQ cluster. So going back to the deployment of the application. Now we saw how to deploy the producer using uh, the kubectl create or kubectl apply command. Now I have again a set of PowerShell script which deploys all the components and this is available as part of the PowerShell folder. So let's go there and let's deploy all the components required for our application. So if I list the PowerShell, there is a script called deploy tech talks hyphen AKS and I'm going to run this script now. So this will deploy the consumer and producer as well as part of one script. So you can look at the contents of the script in the PowerShell folder to see what it's doing. It simply goes and looks at the TechTox consumer root directory and recursively runs the kubectl apply command. And the same way it does it for the TechTox producer root directory as well. So earlier I showed you hyphen R and hyphen F the other version of this command is to use the fully qualified name or full name, hyphen hyphen recursive and hyphen hyphen file name. Uh, it's up to the personal choice whether you want to use the short form or you want to use the full form. So now that uh, all the components of this application are deployed, let's see on the kubectl command line, what do we get when we say get pods? So we have one instance of the consumer pod running and two instances of the producer and everything is in healthy state, in running state. The producers were created about uh, seven or eight minutes back and the consumer has been created just now. So now let's go and start producing the messages. In order to produce the message, I need to hit the API, API endpoint and that is available using this public IP which is assigned to the uh, RabbitMQ producer service. So I can get this IP address 
where the API is available and let me go to postman and use that address to hit the API. So uh, we access the API using uh, slash API tech talks. That's the uh, controller tech talks controller. There is a method called generate and it takes the number of messages as the parameter. So let me go and specify, let's start with 500 as the number of messages. And when I click on the send button, if everything is fine, I should get the response as 200. So that means the API call was successful. Let's go on to the RabbitMQ side and see if these messages were generated. So we have the queue created here, hello, and you can see there were around 500 messages at this point of time. And uh, out of those 500, uh, 20 are being consumed now, and we can see here the number of consumers is one. So we can see the application in action where the API is able to create 500 messages and the consumer is picking 20 messages in a batch and it's processing. So let's look at the logs of the producer and consumer to verify that whatever I'm saying is correct. So let's look at one of these logs for the producer. And hopefully this is the one which got hit in terms of creating that message. Yes. So you can see here that uh, it says uh, publish message to the queue uh, number of times and this is coming from the log message. So every time a message is written to the RabbitMQ, we are logging it here. So this proves that the producer worked fine. Let's look at the consumer. So we don't have the consumer pod showing here. Let's refresh. And now we have the consumer also showing. So if I go into the logs of the consumer here, we can see that uh, it's logging that uh, tech talk has been persisted successfully at a particular time. And if you look at the time interval between two messages, it's incrementing every two seconds. So this is because of that fake delay which we have introduced and you can see that that fake object creation process also is creating uh, random names for the tech talks. So with this, we have deployed the application. We have created the messages using the producer and we have started consuming it using the consumer. Now let's go back here and see that the amount of messages which are getting consumed via one consumer is uh, very low. So uh, as we are limiting it to a batch of 20 and there is only one consumer. So until 20 messages are processed, uh, it will be all the other messages would be in the waiting. And uh, this will take a long, long time to consume all these messages. So let's look at a couple of options where we can scale this consumer. So to scale it, I will again go back to the command prompt and run a couple of kubectl commands. So let's clear this. First option is I can scale the deployment itself, which is related to the consumer. So I can run a kubectl scale command and let's look at the help of the scale. How can we scale? So if you look at the definition, scale allows us to scale the replicas for replica set. Uh, it can be done for a particular pod, it can be done for a stateful set, it can be done for deployment. And since we are using deployment for our consumer, uh, let's go and scale the deployment. So kubectl scale and I want to scale my deployment which is named as Let's look at the version. So if I look at the definition of the consumer, the name of my deployment is RabbitMQ consumer deployment. So this is the deployment I want to scale. 
and I would need to specify the number of instances. So let me just look at the definition again for the help. So replicas in case of deployment, it's the replicas again. So yeah, let's go scale. HTL scale deployment. The name of deployment is RabbitMQ consumer deployment and I can say replicas equal to currently there is one. Let's scale it to three replicas. And let's look at the replicas now. HTL get deployment so you can see that the rabbit mq consumer deployment has uh, scaled up to 3 now and we can verify this by going into the UI as well. Let's go into the Kubernetes dashboard and here we see that there are three pods running of the RabbitMQ consumer deployment. And if we look at the RabbitMQ management UI, now there are 60 messages being uh, picked up or processed and there are three consumers running. So this is one option where uh, we use the name of the deployment or what is already deployed onto the cluster and scale it. The other option to scale is by using the file itself. So uh, let me go back onto the folder where that file is residing. So it's under K8S and we have the Tech Talks consumer. So here if you look, there is this deployment file. Now I can use this file to scale itself. So I can say kubectl scale give the file name which is consumer deployment in this case. And let's increase the replicas from three to five. And let's do kubectl get deployment. So now we can see uh, the deployment count has increased from three to five. So uh, when we use this replicas, uh, again, it is based on the desired state configuration approach of the Kubernetes API. Since we said the desired state is five, it did not add five more replicas. There were already three replicas running. So it has increased the scale to uh, five from three. And uh, since we are having five replicas, uh, if we look at the number of pods running here, kubectl get pods, we should see the five pods running for consumer. So you can see that the age of each of the pod is uh, different here. So now if we go back to RabbitMQ, uh, we can see that those five pods, since there were 500 messages, uh, they have been picked up by the uh, five consumers. And since the batch size of each of them is 20, uh, these five, uh, 500 messages have been consumed and you can see the load has dropped uh, clearly here. Now let's go and increase the count of the messages and let's fire slightly bigger chunk of load. So. Let me go back to Postman here and from 500, let's increase the number of messages to 2000. 
so 2000 messages has been sent and we should see a load kicking in here this ui refreshes every five seconds so yes we can see a spike here and we can see that the number of messages here has changed accordingly so we sent 2000 and from the 2000 uh, based on those five consumers 100 messages have been picked because of the size of 20 batch size of 20 for each consumer Now let's look at how do we change the value of the environment variable and redeploy the application So This is the consumer deployment I have and these are the values so what I want to show you here is uh, the consumers which are consuming 20 messages now uh, without making a code change we can change the value of the batch size here and redeploy this consumer and it should start picking uh, whatever is the new size of the batch so let's change from 20 to 50 and we need to redeploy this version of the consumer so now i have changed one of the configuration value and to apply this again i need to go and run the kubectl apply command so now I'm in the same folder where the deployment file manifest file exists. So I can run kubectl apply for a shortcut. Let me say use the file and recursive, but there is only one file. So it doesn't really matter much. And it says that this has been configured. So let's see what happens here. kubectl get pods. So you can see that the consumer deployment is uh, terminating and as per this definition there should only be one replica of that particular consumer running so now it is looking at the definition that is provided the kubectl api and it says i don't need to run the five replicas of the consumer and it's going to terminate those and it's running only one instance so if we go back into the RabbitMQ UI, what we should see is there is only one consumer and 50 messages are unacknowledged. That means this consumer has picked up 50 messages. And we can follow the same process that if I want to scale this, I can say kubectl scale. And give the file name in this case and it is consumer deployment and let's specify the replicas as 10 and now if we get the pods we can see that again uh, number of replicas has increased and those are getting created so while those are getting created as and when they get created and they start picking up the messages here we can see that now 500 messages are unacknowledged because those 10 consumers they have picked 500 messages and they are processing now so now let's go back to the presentation and continue from where we left. So we looked at the application in live. How does it work? We looked at the demo of building and publishing the Docker images using Docker Compose. We looked at uh, deploying the RabbitMQ on the cluster and the application itself. We also scaled it manually. So. That brings me to the end of this uh, demo and let me summarize what we did. We recreated the AKS cluster using initialize AKS script which was demonstrated in much more detail in the first part. But this time we overwrote uh, one of the variables or parameters which was the resource group name. In the next part we installed RabbitMQ on the AKS cluster using deploy RabbitMQ PowerShell script which internally uses Helm charts. Then we built and published Docker images using Docker multi-stage builds. 
as specified in the Docker file for TechTalks producer and consumer. And then we use the build and publish commands on the Docker Compose. And finally, we deployed the application to AKS cluster by combining a set of PowerShell scripts as well as Kubernetes manifest files. So we deployed the producer and uh, exposed it as a service using a public IP. We deployed the consumer using just the deployment and we injected runtime variables using the Kubernetes environment variable support. And uh, the structure of the Kubernetes files are available here in the screenshot. So we have the tech talks consumer, which has the consumer deployment manifest and the tech talks producer, which has the producer deployment and the producer service definitions as specified in the Kubernetes manifest files. So with that, uh, let's look at some of the references. So uh, this I had explained in the previous video as well that there is a wonderful resource available on Microsoft Azure to learn about Kubernetes and AKS in general, which says uh, 50 days from zero to hero with Kubernetes. If you want to learn more about building uh, containerized applications and .NET microservices, here are some references. These are available as eBooks, freely available and quite helpful. Then we have uh, Play with Docker if you want to learn more about Docker. So it's an online environment where you can run a set of Docker commands and you can play around with Docker. Same way, play with Kubernetes. So you want to learn Kubernetes, don't have an environment of your own or you don't want to mess with your own computer, you can use this play with Kubernetes online environment. There is a Microsoft Learning Path, MS Learn for Kubernetes. And there is also Linux Academy Learning Path. So the screenshot of Linux Academy is available on the right. Uh, as part of the Linux Academy, we also have two certifications available specific to Kubernetes, the Cloud Native Certified Kubernetes Administrator and the Kubernetes Certified Application Developer. So if you're interested in those, you can follow these learning paths. And that brings me to the end of this uh, session. If you want to connect with me on any of the social media, these are the links you can refer to and get in touch with me. So thank you very much for viewing this video. I hope it was useful. If you like it, please hit the like button, share it with your friends and please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.